Hello, everybody, and welcome to History Slash Law Bite number 331, dated December 13th, 2021. I'm Walter, your mobile historian and blue collar scholar. Thank you so much for tuning in today. This History Slash Law Bite is entitled Kilo versus City of New London, 545 U.S. 469 2005. Before I begin, however, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Juarez Lee Shelton M.A. And in addition to that, please also click on the little notification bell immediately to the right of the subscribe button. In doing so, you will receive notifications when I post new, exciting, and enlightening videos in history, law, political science, theology, and philosophy. Thank you so much in advance. You are truly the best. So again, this video is entitled Kilo versus City of New London, 2005. Kilo was a significant and very controversial U.S. Supreme Court decision, which through the Fifth Amendment's takings clause endorsed the ability of governments to take land from private owners and give them to other private owners exclusively in the name of economic development. Sounds exciting, right? Indeed, let's get to the facts. In an effort to revitalize its ailing economy, the city of New London, Connecticut, embarked upon a significant urban renewal project in the name of profit for the company known as Pfizer. To make this happen, the city would need to acquire the land where several private residences were located to then be able to transfer it to the private developers in question, Pfizer. Those developers would in turn eventually redevelop the area, bringing jobs and revenue to New London. Accordingly, many in the selected area, the Fort Trumbull neighborhood of New London, agreed to sell their homes without issue, but others, including Suzette Kilo, refused to do so. This prompted the city to initiate condemnation proceedings against Kilo uh, and the other recalcitrant homeowners. In response, the petitioners initiated suit in the Superior Court of Connecticut, arguing, among other things, that the city's condemnation of their, of their properties violated the public use restriction in the Fifth Amendment's Takings Clause. The Superior Court granted a permanent restraining order prohibiting some of the properties from being taken, but denying similar relief to others. An appeal was then taken to the Supreme Court of Connecticut, which heard arguments in December 2002. In a 4-3 to three decision on March 22, 2004, the state Supreme Court affirmed in part and reversed in part, giving the green light to all of the proposed takings. They ruled that the takings, all in the name of economic development, did not violate the public use clauses of the state and federal constitutions. Indeed, as the project was intended to facilitate economic development in the form of jobs, new tax revenues, and urban development, then it served a public purpose, making it constitutional as a public use. The matter was then appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, which granted certiorari to the case. In accepting the case of Kilo v. New London for review, the Supreme Court would consider questions related to two prior landmark decisions on the subject of eminent domain, Berman v. Parker in 1954 and Hawaii Housing Authority v. Midkiff in 1984. The questions surrounded the issue of whether public purpose constituted a public use for purposes of the Fifth Amendment's takings clause. Oral argument took place at the Supreme Court on February 23, 2005. Attorneys for the petitioner argued that the city of New London had broadly abused its eminent domain powers as restricted by the takings clause in the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. That clause reads that, quote, nor shall any private property be taken for public use without just compensation, end quote. That clause is applicable to the states and by virtue of that, their local governments by way of the 14th Amendment's due process clause which reads, quote, nor shall any state deprive anyone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, end quote. 
Advocates for the petitioners contended that the taking of private property for economic development, taking from one private owner to transfer to another private owner, did not qualify as a public use under the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. On the other side of the lectern, attorneys for the respondent, the city of New London, argued that the condemnations were both legal and justifiable under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments based on the court's prior precedents, especially those in Berman and Hawaii Housing Authority. The court had taken an expanded interpretation of the takings clause, allowing for property to be taken for public purposes, which had been validated as public uses. Needless to say, for those of you who may not remember this case, Kilo was very, very, very controversial, drawing more than 40 amicus curiae filings, 25 alone on behalf of the petitioners. It was well known that eminent domain projects, regardless of the locale or the purpose, tended to target politically weak or disadvantaged communities, primarily those inhabited by minority residents as well as the elderly. The case was heard by seven members of the Supreme Court with Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the most senior justice present at the time, presiding. Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist was absent due to health reasons and Associate Justice John Paul Stevens was delayed in his return from vacation. Both members, however, read the briefs and transcripts and participated in the final decision. That takes us to the issue presented. So the Supreme Court had to consider the following issue in deciding this case. Does the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, as applicable to the states via the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, prohibit states from taking private property exclusively for economic development purposes? That takes us to the opinion of the court. The answer to the question presented was no. On June the 23rd, 2005, in a 5-4 to four opinion by Justice John Paul Stevens, the Supreme Court sustained the constitutionality of the property takings by the City of New London under the 5th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution and affirmed the holding of the Supreme Court of Connecticut. Stevens reasoned that the taking of the land from one private owner to another for the furtherance of economic development constituted a legitimate public purpose under the Constitution. Stevens's majority opinion was joined in full by Justices David Souter, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Stephen Breyer. Justice Anthony M. Kennedy filed a concurring opinion in this case, and Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Clarence Thomas filed dissenting opinions. Justices O'Connor, Justice O'Connor's dissent was joined in full by Justice, Chief Justice William Rehnquist and Associate Justices Antonin Scalia, and Clarence Thomas. So, the summary of the opinion in this case, the governmental taking of property from one private owner to another private owner in the name of facilitating economic development qualifies as a public use under the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment uh, and as applied to the states via the Fourteenth Amendment's uh, due process clause. All right? So, Justice John Paul Stevens' opinion contained the following points. Number one, though the city could not take petitioner's land simply to confer a private benefit on a particular private party, the takings issue here would be executed pursuant to a carefully considered development plan which was not adopted to benefit a particular class of identifiable individuals. Moreover, while the city is not planning to open the condemned land, at least not its entirety, to use by the general public, this court long ago rejected any literal requirement that condemned property be put into use for the public, per se. Rather, it has embraced the broader and more natural interpretation of public use as public purpose. Without exception, the court has determined that concept broadly, rejecting its long-standing policy of deference reflecting, excuse me, its long-standing policy of deference to legislative judgments as to what public needs justify the use of the takings power. Number two, as with other exercises in urban planning and development, the city is trying to coordinate a variety of commercial, residential, and recreational land uses with the hope that they will form a whole greater than the sum of its parts. 
To effectuate this plan, the city has invoked a state statute that specifically authorizes the use of eminent domain to promote economic development. Given the plan's comprehensive character, the thorough deliberation that preceded its adoption, and the limited scope of this court's review in such cases, it is highly appropriate here, as it was in Berman, to resolve the challenges of the individual owners, not on a piecemeal basis, but rather in light of the entire plan. Because that plan unquestionably serves a public purpose, the takings challenged here satisfy the Fifth Amendment. And last, petitioner's proposal that the court adopt a new bright line rule that economic development does not qualify as a public use is supported neither by precedent nor logic. Promoting economic development is a traditional and long accepted governmental function, and there is no principled way of distinguishing it from the other public purposes the court has recognized. Also rejected is petitioner's argument that for takings of this kind, the court should require a reasonable certainty that the expected public benefits will actually accrue. Such a rule would represent an even greater departure from the court's precedent. The disadvantages of a heightened form of review are especially pronounced in this type of case, where orderly implementation of a comprehensive plan requires all the interested parties' legal rights to be established before new construction can commence. The court declines to second-guess the wisdom of the means the city has selected to effectuate its plan. So the decision here drew one concurring opinion, as I've mentioned, by Justice Anthony Kennedy. Kennedy's concurrence, while agreeing with the uh, outcome of the case, um, emphasized a more detailed standard of judicial review for economic takings in the name of development. Kennedy wrote... um, that the court, in applying rational basis review under the public use clause, should strike down a taking that, by a clear showing, is intended to favor a particular private party with only incidental or pretextual public benefits, just as a court applying rational basis review under the Equal Protection Clause must strike down a government classification that is clearly intended to injure a particular class of private parties with only incidental or pretextual public justifications. As the trial court in this case was correct to observe, where the purpose of a taking is economic development and that development is to be carried out by private parties or private parties will be benefited, the court must decide if the stated public purpose, economic advantage to a city sorely in need of it, is only incidental to the benefits that will be confined on private parties of a development plan. In sum, While there may be categories of cases in which the transfers are so suspicious or the procedures employed so prone to abuse or the purported benefits are so trivial or implausible that courts should presume an impermissible private purpose, no such circumstances are present in this case. So four justices dissented in Kelo v. New London, Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist and Justices Sandra Day O'Connor, Antonin Scalia, and Clarence Thomas. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the principal dissent uh, in this case to Justice Stevens' majority opinion, and she was joined uh, in full by Chief Justice Rehnquist, Justice Scalia, and Justice Thomas. Justice O'Connor criticized how the decision would open the door for limitless eminent domain power and the perpetual empowerment of corporations and the wealthy over the disadvantaged in society. Her dissent contained the following points. Today, the court abandons this long-held basic limitation on governmental power. Under the banner of economic development, all private property is now vulnerable to being taken and transferred to another private owner so long as it might be upgraded, i.e. given to an owner who will use it in a way that the legislature deems more beneficial to the public in the process. To reason, as the court does, that the incidental public benefits resulting from the subsequent ordinary use of private property render economic development takings for public use is to wash out any distinction between private and public use of property and thereby effectively delete the words for public use from the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. Accordingly, I respectfully dissent. Any property may now be taken for the benefit of another private party. But the fallout from this decision will not be random. The beneficiaries are likely to be those citizens with disproportionate influence and power in the political process, including large corporations and development firms. As for the victims, the government now has license to transfer property 
from those with fewer resources to those with more. The founders cannot have intended this perverse result. That alone, quote, is a just government, wrote James Madison, which impartially secures to every man whatever is his own. Right? End quote. I would hold that the takings in both Parcel 3 and Parcel 4A are unconstitutional. Reverse the judgment of the Supreme Court of Connecticut and remand for further proceedings. Justice Clarence Thomas also dissented, arguing that the court should abandon the flawed precedents leading up to Kelo and return to the original meaning of the takings clause. Justice Thomas wrote, Long ago, William Blackstone wrote that the law of the land postpones even public necessity to the sacred and violable rights of private property. Right? The framers embodied that the principle in the Constitution allowing the government to take property not for public necessity, but instead for public use. Defying this understanding, the court replaces the public use clause with a public purpose clause. This deferential shift in phraseology enables the court to hold against all common sense that a costly urban renewal project whose stated purpose is a vague promise of new jobs and increased tax revenue, but which is also suspiciously agreeable to the Pfizer Corporation, is for a public use. The court has elsewhere recognized the overriding respect for the sanctity of the home that has been embedded in our traditions since the origins of the Republic, when the issue is only whether the government may search a home. Yet today, the court tells us that we are not to second-guess the city's considered judgments, when the issue is, instead, whether the government may take the infinitely more intrusive step of tearing down petitioners' homes. Something has gone seriously awry with the court's interpretation of the Constitution. Though citizens are safe from the government in their homes, the homes themselves are not. Once one accepts, as the court at least nominally does, that the public use clause is a limit on the eminent domain power of the federal government and the states, there is no justification for the almost complete deference it grants to legislatures as to what satisfies it. The harmful consequences of today's decision are not difficult to predict and promise to be harmful. So-called urban renewal programs provide some compensation for the properties they take, but no compensation is possible for the subjective value of these lands to the individuals displaced and the indignity inflicted by uprooting them from their homes. Allowing the government to take property solely for public purposes is bad enough, but extending the concept of public purpose to encompass any economically beneficial goal guarantees that these losses will fall disproportionately on poor communities. Those communities are not only systemically, systematically less likely to put their lands to the highest and best social use, but are also the least politically powerful. When faced with a clash of constitutional principle in a line of unreasoned cases wholly divorced from the text, history, and structure of our founding document, we should not hesitate to resolve the tension in favor of the Constitution's original meaning. For the reasons I've given and for the reasons given in Justice O'Connor's dissent, the conflict of principle raised by this boundless use of the eminent domain power should be resolved in petitioner's favor. I would reverse the judgment of the Connecticut Supreme Court. So Justice Thomas and Justice O'Connor both uh, have, you know, very uh, similar uh, sounding dissents, uh, very reasoned in principle that the uh, green light the court gave to uh, local governments to use eminent domain essentially opens the door uh, for limitless eminent domain power, uh, allowing the powerful to prey on the powerless, all right, giving corporations the ability to uh, take, you know, land uh, from uh, politically disadvantaged communities as long as they promise the local government in question is going to bring benefits to the city, you know, and uh, sadly, only four members of the court uh, saw the forest for the trees in this case, all right? So the judgment of the court here, the Supreme Court of Connecticut was affirmed. The laws applied, Amendments 5 and 14 of the United States Constitution. That takes us to the legacy of Kelo. 
So again, needless to say, Kilo versus New London uh, 2005 was a very unpopular decision. Um, one condemned and vilified by individuals and officials across the political spectrum, believe it or not. Democratic politicians condemned the decision as empowering the politically advantaged and wealthy against minorities and the poor. Republican politicians condemned it as a blatant assault on property rights. In response to the decision, numerous states enacted laws uh, reforming their eminent domain laws uh, and restricting the power to take private property for economic development. As of 2019, 45 states had enacted some sort of restrictive legislation in response to Kelo and the ability of local governments to use their eminent domain power to take private property, all right, for any form of public use, all right. After the decision, the city threatened to charge the homeowners for back rent, you know, which was really terrible. Uh, but under pressure from the governor of Connecticut, the city of New London would pay substantial additional compensation for the loss of their homes uh, as the land was never officially deeded back to the uh, people in the Fort Trumbull neighborhood. Most of these people have relocated to other parts of uh, Connecticut. In 2008, uh, the Suzette Kilo House was dedicated uh, near downtown New London. You know, someone... Uh, purchased the property. It was deconstructed and uh, fully uh, rebuilt um, in another a part of New London. And it's available as a tourist attraction today, uh, as a memorial to these horrifying events. Um, she too, uh, for the record, has moved to a different part of the state. Ironically, the developer, Pfizer, was un unable to get financing for the project here. And it was ultimately abandoned altogether, leaving a vacant lot that is currently generating no tax revenue whatsoever for the city of New London. So the city is in a worse position than before, because at least before you had the property taxes coming from those properties in the area. Now, nothing. Brilliant. So Pfizer, for whom all of this was conceived, uh, merged with Wyeth and chose to retain its Groton facility uh, over the one in New London. Thus, the New London facility was closed in late 2010, leading to uh, the loss of about a 1,000 jobs, um, uh, which coincided with the expiration of tax breaks for Pfizer, which would have increased their tax bill by almost 400%. So anyone can see that this was all strategically planned, all right? All of this had been done for Pfizer, and they essentially walked away from the project, which had included a hotel retail condo urban village. That never happened. Sadly, the cost of this whole endeavor to purchase and bulldoze the houses cost the city and state $78 million. The promised 3,000 plus new jobs and $1.2 million in annual tax revenue never materialized. And to this day, the area remains a vacant lot, an eyesore, to say the least. The author of the infamous Kelo decision, the late Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, came to admit that he seriously misinterpreted precedents in his majority opinion. But until his death in July of 2019, he stood his ground in the belief that he got the result correct. He also conceded that Kelo was probably the most unpopular opinion that he or anyone else wrote in his nearly 35 years on the Supreme Court from 1975 to 2010. By contrast, former Connecticut Supreme Court Justice Richard Palmer, one of the justices who voted for the city before the matter went to the Supreme Court, personally apologized to Suzette Kilo in 2010. He remarked, had I known all of what you just told us, I would have voted differently. Needless to say, Ms. Kilo was speechless and began to cry. It was the first time in this saga that anyone at fault had ever issued her an apology for the nightmare that she and so many others had endured. Had he voted differently, the homes in the Fort Trumbull neighborhood would likely 
have been saved, and this matter would have never proceeded to the Supreme Court. So Kelo is one of the Supreme Court's Dred Scots, which refers to the 1857 decision in Dred Scott versus Sanford. Um, it is an expression used to describe the court's most infamous and abysmally horrible decisions that have given legal blessing to serious societal evils. These are evils that typically run contrary to the concepts of uh, liberty and equality and perpetuate various forms of injustice. Now, I myself was 20 years old uh, when Kilo was handed down. Um, I was a sophomore in college, and I remember the decision quite vividly, all right? And it remains just as horrible today uh, as it was in 2005. But thankfully, uh, public awareness of eminent domain uh, has at least somewhat increased as laws have been enacted in the vast majority of the states to limit uh, its abuse. Last but not least, a movie was released in 2018 uh, on the whole Kilo versus New London debacle entitled Little Pink House, uh, and it very accurately depicts the unsuccessful battles uh, Suzette Kilo and her neighbors waged to preserve their homes uh, from condemnation. For the record, once again, Suzette Kilo's Little Pink House was uh, saved, though it no longer stands where it once did. The property was dismantled, uh, relocated, and restructured in downtown New London at 36 Franklin Street, where Franklin and College Streets, Cottage Streets, excuse me, uh, meet. The house stands as a vivid reminder of the uh, brutality of eminent domain abuse. Okay, so that is Kilo versus New London, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 545 U.S. 469, 2005. And before we depart, I'll give you a summary of the opinion once more. And that is that the governmental taking of private property, all right, giving it from one private owner to another private owner in the name of facilitating economic development qualifies as a public use under the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment, and as applied to the states via the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So I thank you uh, very much for listening uh, to this summary of Kilo versus uh, City of New London. Uh, if you liked the video, learned a thing or two from it, uh, appreciated the information, drop me a like. That would be very greatly appreciated. Uh, if you've not subscribed to my YouTube channel at this point, please do so now. That means more than you will ever know. Uh, Juarez Lee Shelton, M.A. Tell others about my channel, especially those who are doing legal research and need uh, further education on how to break down Supreme Court cases. Uh, so I conclude uh, with the... Uh, ever, ever um, inspiring and uh, long-living words of one of my teaching role models, Mr. George Feeney. Believe in yourself, dream, try, do good. Take care of yourselves and be blessed and stay safe. And I'll talk to you at the next video. Cheers.